So let's talk about what we're here to talk about. Best practices for teaching in a simulator. Um, obviously, I'm super biased. I have a red shirt on. All the pictures in this presentation are Redbirds. But really, um, this applies to any simulator that you have at your flight school. So if you have one of those ones from somebody else that makes them, that's fine. Um, as long as you use them well and teach um, pilots to be better and safer and to have them accomplish their goals um, quickly or, or more quick and in a more cost-effective way, that's fine. When you want to upgrade, just let me know. We'll, we'll get you sorted out. Um, all right, so a little about me. I'm Josh. I'm the VP of Marketing for Redbird. I'm also a CFI, IIMEI. Um, Redbird used to have a flight school in San Marcos, Texas for a while you may have heard of called Skyport. Uh, I helped run that. Um, I have, I don't know how many hours, way too many hours inside of a Redbird sim training students. Um, and we ran things at Skyport. We did th try to do things a little differently. Well, we had that operation where we did really um, heavy sim training in private pilot, in the private pilot program, in the Abinitio program, um, like 35 hours of sim in, in Abinitio. So a lot of this presentation in particular comes from that experience. Um, and I will say, um, I do tend to focus a little bit more on the ab initio side. There's a lot of stuff that applies to an instrument training as well in here. But generally speaking, most instructors intuitively get how to use a simulator in an instrument training environment, right? You shoot approaches with it. You fly the instruments with it. The things that are a little more tricky sometimes can be, how would I use it for a private pilot student? Um, so I will t talk about that a little bit, but a lot of the stuff in here applies to any training event, whether it be private, instrument, a BFR, IFR, or IPC, just recurrent refresher training, all that kind of stuff, it'll apply. Um, so what we're going to talk about, what it's good at, what the sim's good at, what it's not good at, which is just as important, um, how we, the kind of the keys to teaching in a simulator, um, we'll do a couple of examples. And we'll talk a little bit about emergency training and the things that we can do in a sim that we really can't do in the airplane. Um, and then I do, you know, this presentation is, I've given it a lot, but it's different every time because it, there's a lot of time in here for questions and I'd love to, I'd love to get some conversations going on it. So uh, who in the room, raise your hand if you've instructed in a simulator before. Okay, so we got quite a bit of experience. Who in the room has instructed private pilot students? in a simulator. We got a couple? Okay. Awesome. Okay. So what a simulator is. It's a tool. Um, it's a tool to deliver a product. Your product is a well-trained pilot that's prepared for a check ride or prepared to go out into the real world and exercise their privileges of their certificate. Um, it is a tool. It is not an airplane. Um, we need to use it as though it is um, like a good way to think about it. Um, the, the way I think about it is back at the Redbird factory, we have a CNC router table that cuts all kinds of parts, right? That thing is critical to making our products, but it is not our product. Um, and so a lot of times schools will you view the airplane flight time as a product. They'll view, and then they get in this weird thing where they start viewing, the instructors start viewing the simulator as, ah, it's just an airplane stand-in. It's not. There are lots of things you can do in the sim that you cannot do in the sim in the airplane, but there are plenty of things that it's a waste of time to do in the simulator as well. So it's a tool to delivering your product as a flight instructor or as a flight school business. So some things that uh, we use the sim for. A lot of these are pretty obvious, right? Procedures training, maneuver training. We can go through checklist familiarization, everything from the basics of how do the rudder pedals work and why do the toes move. Um, up through how do I load an ILS approach and uh, if I go missed, what happens when I hit suspend? You know, things like that. Those are sort of the kind of the basics that we get from the simulator. We can also talk about avionics and um, uh, familiarization as well. Situational awareness. I think this is actually one of the places in private pilot training the sim is so good at because that's, um, it's actually the example event that I'll show later. Um, your average private pilot student, you know, once they get the basics of keeping the airplane straight and level and sort of getting through, you know, flying the airplane, um, a lot of the struggles happen because they're just, they are drinking from a hot fire hose and cannot keep situational awareness about what's going on around them. Um, and the sim is a place where we can really isolate down to key things, have them focus on that, 
and then expand out and add, um, add complications as they get more and more proficient with stuff. Um, and then decision making and emergency training. This is also a place where instructors, I think, naturally go with the sim. Let's fail some stuff. Let's make the weather really bad. Um, and I think a lot of it comes from, are there any airline pilots in the room that are also flight instructors? Yep. So on the airline side or the professional pilot side, you do sim recurrent all the time. Um, and that style of training is very good. It's proven to be extremely effective for professional pilots. But it is not the way we use simulators for a new pilot when we're teaching something. Um, we'll talk about it some more, but you, you don't want to make the experience of the simulator so miserable every time they get in it where everything, it's always breaking, the weather's always terrible. Like that's not what the sim is for in this environment, in this training environment. Um, so maybe, this slide is the, I've edited it a, a bunch of times. I used to say some other stuff and I've had customers come back and say, no, I use the sim for that, it's perfect, it's great. Um, so maybe don't use the sim for teaching the flare. Really, I'm talking all of these things are uh, or at least the first two are really edge of the, kind of edge of the envelope stuff. Um, when you're outside, when in in the middle of the envelope, our sim, pretty much everybody else's sim behaves really well. Um, at the edge of the envelope, it starts to break down. The math model that drives it breaks down. And I've flown level D sims, and they can get kind of weird sometimes when you're down, you know, near the edge of the envelope as well. Um, the flare, I'm a uh, so. I, I am a part owner in a T6 Texan uh, with my dad, and uh, it's a tailwheel airplane, big engine, a lot of torque. It does rudder blanking as you come down. If you do a wheel landing and you bring the tail down, you'll lose uh, directional authority from the rudder for a split second, and you only have the brakes. I'm a huge believer. It, it has this like awful accelerated stall characteristic. Um, all of that has given me a, a strong found belief in Stick and rudder skills are super important as a private pilot because all you need to fly a T6 is a private pilot certificate and a tailwheel endorsement, and you're legal. You can go out and fly that airplane. Um, and I think we, we focus a lot on avionics and all that stuff, and that's super important. We got to do that. We got to teach them all the tools that are available, but we need to have, they need to have a strong foundation in what does the airplane feel like, how does it behave in, um, in the flare, and in especially stall spin uh, situations. So the flare, that's, it's sacrosanct. That six seconds, not even six seconds, that you get above the runway when you're transitioning from the wings providing a bunch of lift to ground effect, and um, the lift characteristics, the drag characteristics of the airplane are changing, and you're um, adjusting your angle of attack into that, into that transition, um, that's really based on feel. There's a lot of feel involved in that, and um, there's a lot of what it looks like off the dash or off the cowling of that particular airplane. And um, our sim doesn't do a great job of it. Um, when you have the, you know, if you have an LCD screen like this, um, there's not very, the depth perception when you're close up is not very good. So as you get close to the ground, it gets hard to judge the distance between you know, how high above the ground you are. On the bigger sims that do the, the, the more expensive visual systems, it's better. There is some depth perception, but um, you really have to get up to the multi-million dollar sim to, to get those. Um, and even the big sims, the, f the feeling of the flare is not that great. So um, I would never let a pre-solo student land a sim. Um, I would, um, all, I, they can do all the procedures. They can fly the pattern, they can get you know, fly base downwind, the whole thing gets set up on a perfect approach, and they just have them go around. I would not let them land the sim. Once they're able to comfortably land the airplane in the real world, and we're not worried about that, where they, they know what that feels like, they can go ahead. If, you know, if the mission or the scenario calls for a landing, fine, do a landing, that's no problem. Um, especially if it's, when it's not the key thing you're teaching. But um, to get the, the flare feeling, I think you just gotta go around the pattern a bunch and do it, um, and, and really build that muscle memory. Stall buffet detection. So what I'm talking about here is not um, ACS level, you know, first indication of a stall, because that's stall warning horn or something like that. Some, you know, it, typically it's a stall warning horn. You can do that in the sim. You can stall the sim until the warning horn goes off, recover. You can do all those sorts of procedures. But um, I really think that pilots should know what it feels like when the elevator starts vibrating in the back. 
of the airplane, and they get a little feel in the yoke, a little vibration in the yoke, because they're flying real slow. They're right on the edge. Um, and that really comes from um, accelerated stalls. I, I, I think we, we do a little bit of a disservice on the ACS side about not teaching the idea of accelerated stalls, that stalls are not, it's not a speed. <laughs> um, it can happen at various points. And um, in, an acceler in certain airplanes, in an accelerated stall situation, really the only indication is airframe buffet. Um, that's the only place you're really going to feel it. Um, you're not going to get a warning horn or anything like that, and it'll just depart on you if you, keep, if you keep going through that. So I think even at the private pilot level, just show them what it means, when, what an airframe buffet means. You know, go out in the airplane, do it. It's real short. It's not going to take long. Um, the other place is um, on the spins. You can do a spin in the sim. It's going to get weird. Uh, it's not going to look like what you expect. The departure is not going to look right. Um, it will sort of spin around, and the recovery procedures are correct. So you can teach recovery. But if you're the type of person that thinks that people should uh, do one turn in a spin at some point in their training, uh, you're going to want to do that in an airplane so they get that actual experience. And then the last one is aircraft ground handling. Um, flying, uh, taxiing is super weird. You got to do it with your feet. Um, and I'm sure lots of people that have trained private pilots have said, "Put your hands on your, put your hands on your knees, um, while, or, while you're while you're taxiing, because they're trying to drive it around with the with the yoke." Um, the sim, our sim um, model, doesn't really have the idea of um, ground steering. What we do, what the model does, is it it's still flying. It just puts a scaler on the, uh, on the effectiveness of the rudder. And so you slide around like you're on a Zamboni. Um, so you're taking an already kind of difficult thing for people to do, and you make it w weird, um, weirder than it is in the airplane. So just have them taxi. I mean, that's, this is not a hard one, but there are some schools that really like to do everything in the sim first. And this is one where I would say, have them taxi the airplane first. It's not, you know, not that big of a deal. Um, but you can do all kinds of stuff on, um, you know, runway signage recognition, uh, navigating on the runway, hotspot avoidance, all the stuff that, all the safety stuff about ground ops, totally doable in the sim. I just wouldn't teach them how to taxi uh, the first time there. Questions, comments, anything? Okay. Um, all right. So the keys to teaching in a simulator. Uh, what's the biggest obstacle to effective training in the sim? Anybody? Motion sickness, okay. Teaching the instructor how to operate the simulator. Okay, operating the simulator, teaching the instructor how to operate the simulator. The feeling, fidelity maybe. Avionics fidelity, that's a common one. People think the avionics need to be exactly right. So um, I think it's the instructor attitude. If the instructor doesn't want to be there, the pilot's not going to want to be there. If the instructor thinks it's a waste of time, the pilot's going to think it's a waste of time. If you say, yeah, it doesn't feel exactly right, and yeah, the avionics work a little bit different in the airplane, but we can do some really cool stuff in here, and you can learn some things here um, that we can't really teach in the airplane, and this will prepare you for when, when you go out in the airplane, you'll be better prepared, and it'll go smoother and faster, um, that's, that's the right attitude for the instructor to have. This is the hardest thing. This is the thing, when, we, when I talk to flight school owners, this is the hardest thing, is getting instructors on board with it um, as a teaching tool to help them help their students um, achieve their goals and move through the training. So uh, yeah, that's hard, um, but it's key. If, um, and it, it can poison, a especially if they do it early on, and the instructor and the student have a really strong relationship, which a lot of them do, and kind of build a mentor-mentee relationship. If that instructor does not value the time in the sim, that student will not value the time in the sim for their entire training career um, until maybe they get to the airlines and somebody forces it on them. Um, so I would highly suggest working on that if you have the ability to do that. Um, OK, the next one is realism matters, and I mean, both avionics, airplane, you know, the sim hardware, the fidelity of the sim, that matters, but also the whole experience. Um, how many people would go 
for a training flight and not pre-flight the airplane and not look at the weather? Anybody? How many people would hop in the sim, turn it on and go flying? Lots of people, right? That's what I talk, when I say realism matters, pre-flight your sim. Walk around, look at the computer, say, oh, it's plugged in. You know, make up a checklist. It doesn't matter. It's not important for the operation of the sim. It's important for the student to think, oh, I do this before every flight. I pre-flight the airplane, I pre-flight the sim. I look at the weather in the simulated world, in the scenario that I'm going to fly before I go fly, just like I would in the airplane. All of these things, all of that builds to the idea that this is a real training event that has value. I, the, the student is open to the idea that they're learning here, that they're, um, and what they're doing here is important. It's not a waste of time. OK, the most important button in any simulator ever made is the pause and the unpause button. Um, and that's because it's a super powerful tool. You can pause, you can let people think through things. but. Um, it's probably the most abused button in the simulator as well. Uh, lots of um, instructors will pause it as soon as the student struggles. Um, you, this is really an art form that good instructors that have some experience with the sims and are, are keying off their student get really good at. Um, the kind of the general rule of thumb is if the student is still learning, let the sim run live. As soon as their RAM, their memory gets full and they're unable to process any more information and all that's going to happen is them be overwhelmed and not get anything, that's when you pause it and let them recover, figure out what's going on and move forward. So it's, um, I think people pause too much, um, generally speaking, but um, you know, if the student is still able to kind of keep up with what's happening, that's a super important skill that they're going to need in the airplane. It, to be able to get a little behind the airplane and then recover um, as they fly and maintain control is a very important skill that you have to develop, and this is a great place to practice it. So let's not pause it and prevent it from happening. Um, the, uh, the core of the Skyport training method or, or curriculum was the idea of learn, practice, perform, where you learn something on the ground in a ground brief or a, a course, uh, you know, online course or something you learn theory, concept, maneuver, whatever it happens to be, um, there's, there's ground, ground training before you ever try to do it. You practice the maneuver, the theory, the concept, whatever, in the sim first, and you perform it in the airplane. And I get, we get questions sometimes about how do I integrate a simulator into a curriculum, and the easiest answer is do everything in the sim first. Don't do anything in the airplane for the first time other than taxi and stall and landing flares. Um, but everything else, just do in the sim first. You're going to do steep turns. You do a little ground brief. You tell, talk to them about the procedures, what, what they're doing, what the goals are, objectives, all that stuff. Go in the sim, fly it for 15, 20 minutes, let them do a couple of steep turns, and then go out in the airplane and fly it. Um, there's, there are other ways to make it more advanced than that and do you know, build in refresher training sessions into the sim, that kind of stuff. But at a baseline, if you just do it in the sim first before you do it in the airplane, you, you're 90% of the way there, and you're going to save the pilot a ton of money uh, in their training because that 15 minutes in the sim is probably equivalent to 45 minutes in the airplane in terms of taxi, take off, fly out to the practice area, get up to altitude, do it a couple of times. Um, so that by the time they get out to the airplane and they're actually doing it for the first time in the airplane, they basically know what to do. And they're just they're figuring out the nuance of what it means to do this maneuver in this airplane. Um, instructor guidelines. I will throw this up, this slide up again at the end of the presentation. But I, I'm kind of restating a lot of stuff in here. But essentially, the first um, the first two are uh, bad attitude, right? The instructor has to reinforce the value of the simulator, and you have to have a goal for every training session. One of the main killers of a sim training program is when the sim becomes a video game um, and people start goofing off in it. Um, they just hop in it and they, you know, 15 minutes later they're doing loops down the Vegas Strip or something. Um, you, you're really destroying that, the idea that this is a training tool when you allow that to happen. So having a goal really helps with that. We brief every simulator session just like we would brief every flight. 
Uh, we check the weather, and, and I'll show you an example of what I mean by use real world weather. Um, if you have them on your sim, use headsets, seatbelts, all the stuff that builds in realism. Um, and then the, 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 uh, last, the six, seven, and eight are about um, the difference between sort of airline recurrent, professional pilot recurrent training, and training for pilots that are learning to fly. Um, you want to keep failures realistic. Um, in general, general aviation planes, they have mechanical failures. It happens all the time, but they don't have stacked mechanical failures. Um, it's pretty rare for somebody to have an alternator failure and then have their uh, brakes go out on landing or whatever, the, you know, the, like that kind of s multiple stacked failures in unrelated systems. Um, we, I don't recommend that, <laughs> right? The, the, um, and I try to limit failures, major, major weather events to um, about 20% of the sessions at the most um, because you don't want it to be every time they get in the sim, they know, oh, we're going to be talking something's going to happen, you know, you, be, because what that does is that, cre that eliminates your ability to actually ke catch them off guard. Um, because the, one of the keys to the simulator when we get into talking about rich risk management and judgment is you have to, they have to be surprised when things go wrong. Um, and so if every time they get in the situation, in the sim, things go wrong, you, you remove that ability. And then uh, the last one, or the, the second to last one, never create inescapable situations. Um, the, it, you know, the, the classic is you're flying in a thunderstorm, your avionics go out, you're on an ILS approach, and um, the engine fails at the final approach fixed. I don't know what lesson you're teaching that student other than they're going to die in aviation, right? Like that, there's no, there is no outcome there that's really very positive. So what I, whenever you develop a scenario um, where you're trying to get them to, to manage risk or think about emergency procedures, there needs to be, at least somewhere in that scenario, there needs to be an out. There needs to be a good choice that they could make um, and get themselves out of the situation um, so that you can use that as a teaching point. Because otherwise, I mean, what's the ground, what's the debrief on that flight? Like that, the, you right, exactly. Um, and then no one to pause, like we discussed. Okay, questions on any of that? You guys are just, you must be doing really good today. No questions. You're covering all the bases. Yes, sir. You make a list of things to not do. Mm hmm. This one procedures training, um, maneuvers training, checklist familiarization. In, um, avionics and situational awareness, decision-making, risk judgment. We'll talk about uh, a two examples, a VFR example and an IFR example of uh, f these sort of flight profiles that I would do in a simulator. But really, um, anything that's not on this list is, I think, fair game to do in a simulator. Okay, so when I say use real, wor real world weather, um, some sim systems will let you pull in live weather, which is interesting, but um, I don't think that useful for training. Because what you want to do is you want to present weather scenarios to the pilot that um, maybe half of them are just normal weather that they would see in the local area, and maybe the other half of them are, you know, maybe a third of them are um, normal weather that could develop into bad weather. And then a, a small fraction of them are, you know, this is a bad weather situation, right? And how are we going to handle it? But you would like, and you want to have scenarios pre-built, you know, starting conditions pre-built to match that weather. So um, I don't fly. I'm not an active instructor anymore. I, don't, I only fly with my family. But I still, first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is check the aviation weather every day. Um, I think a lot of pilots are like that. And when I was actively teaching, I would check the weather, and if it was um, fit in one of those categories, you know, kind of standard weather, or maybe this, oh, this could develop into there's a little front coming in or something like that. Um, I would, uh, at the time, I was using uh, AD ADDS, but now it's for flight, so I would ca capture screenshots of it. So this is uh, an example I did a couple years ago, flying from Austin Executive to College Station, Giga Maggie's. Um, and uh, I did the whole thing in four flight, got a nav briefing, 
I got a weather report. Um, and what it looks like is we got a front to the north of Texas, in the north part of Texas, little patchy, isolated, uh, low clouds. This is very common weather. We get a bunch of moisture that comes up from the Gulf, and we get kind of low clouds that'll burn off through the day. But there's that front up there. Um, you know, the isobars aren't very stacked at all, but it could develop, it could swing down. It's the kind of, this is one of the, falls in the category of normal weather that you could build a scenario on where the weather would become an event later in the day. Um, you'll see that we have basically IFR at EDC at time of departure um, and, uh, and, and marginal VFR at College Station, but it gets better through the day. This is just a nine, nine times out of ten when I load this scenario up, it does, it's just fine. If weather burns off, we get high broken clouds, it's no problem. But I put it in there so that they, um, I have the potential later in the training potentially to use the same scenario to discuss a fast moving front or something like that. Um, and on this note, uh, I really hate this about um, prepared, the, the, the sim engine we use. Um, it loads, the default flight loads clear skies and 50 plus miles of visibility, completely unrealistic. Um, on the IFR side, um, this, is, this, this one is really for somebody who's, um, you know, probably close to a check ride. Um, and one of the, the unique situations about how we generally give check rides is that we, um, they don't really match, IFR check rides is they don't really match um, the actual experience of flying in the system, right? You go one approach, go missed, another approach, go missed, third approach, go missed, and then go home. Um, which is not what you would typically do on an IFR flight. And one of the, this is one of the skills that really, I think, limits pilots and, their, and, and limits their ability to do well on the check ride is approach briefing and setting up the uh, avionics in the cockpit for that specific approach quickly and efficiently. Um, and so this is for somebody who knows how to fly an approach, but we w we're really preparing them to demonstrate that ability in a check ride environment where it's going to be bam, 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 bam. So we'll take a, um, we'll do a, a ground brief. We're going to start the simulator in, in, in air, unpaused. Structure is going to be ATC. We'll do vectors to final six times-ish, five times, seven times, depending on how much time you have. Um, and then they'll either go, they'll either land or they'll go missed. And what I want to do is have them shoot six different ILSs all over. You probably want to do it on the ILS that they're going to shoot on their check ride. Maybe the middle one after they do two and then they, the third one they do is the one they're going to do on their check ride. Um, but I want them to fly a bunch of different ILS approaches all over the country and brief that approach while flying the airplane in real time, get all the avionics set up in a compressed timeline, in a really compressed time, um, training event. And so there's none of the flying around, getting ready. It's, you know, they're basically on vector to intercept the localizer um, when they start. So they got to they gotta figure out how do I look at that, that approach plate, get the information I need from it, and put it into my avionics efficiently and quickly. Um, and you do something like this, you're, you, it, after six times, it, I mean, humans just get really good at that. Once they get that pattern down, once they understand what they're looking for, they can get really good at it. And I think this is a, this would be a great flight to do, you know, right before their last check ride flight. Um, so you do this and then they go out and you do a, check, a mock check ride with them in the airplane and then they go to the check ride. Um, it's, you're not teaching the approach, you're really teaching how do I, um, you know, brief an approach, get the information out and get it in the cockpit. Any questions? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The RFR. Art of IFR. A lot of both. Real assumption one. You know about the similar. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was based. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's good feedback. 
I like. If you're good training in it via bar, sure. you understand the sensitivity yeah. of the aircraft and how the radio is set up. Yeah. So you need a lot of time so, in a simulator for yeah. this. I would 100% agree with that. And um, I don't know who the scenario designer was for Art of IFR, but we, we, and we're talking about the Pilot Proficiency Center now. Um, Redbird, we, I did, personally did the uh, Killer Procedures Clinic, um, which is about landing and takeoff accidents. And for that reason, I included a 10-minute uh, sim familiarization block in the sim session um, because I think you, that's a totally valid point. You have got to get familiar with what the simulation is, how it handles, what the avionics you're looking at before you're going to get any kind of training value out of it. So that's good feedback. I'll take it back to them. Yeah. The killer procedures, yeah. yeah. Ten minutes wasn't enough. Uh, Yeah, if if uh, you're talking in a like somebody's working on an instrument rating or something like that, yes, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, does it make sense to spend time in the sim just working on the avionics, getting familiar with them um, in the cockpit, without necessarily um, you know doing approaches or something like that? Um, and the answer was very much yes. That would that would in a in the traditional program that would come you know right at the beginning of the training. Um, in an IFR, um, uh, in an IFR curriculum, I would do. Um, the, this is just my personal way I do it. The first thing I do is I, we, uh, the first lesson will be an actual IFR, and maybe not in actual, but an IFR flight in the system somewhere, so they can see what it, a real flight looks like. Um, so that we take off, we go somewhere, we shoot an approach there, and we get lunch or something, and then we fly back. Um, and, and I preface it with. Once you get your ticket, this is what IFR flights will look like. The next X number of months that you're going to be in training, IFR flights will not look like this. You're just going to be banging out approaches. Um, but just so they have some context of what they're building towards. And then the, the following thing I would do was, would be that. I would sit in the sim, and I would go through the avionics in depth with them, with the GPS in depth with them. And what is, you know, what's the difference between loading an approach and activating an approach? What's the diff what does activate vectors to final mean? And I would introduce that early on, even probably before we talked about approaches, so that they, when, they, when we do talk about a specific, oh, okay, we're going to fly an ILS approach now, they have at least in the back of their head, oh, yeah, we talked about I'm going to load the approach now, but when, before I get to the final approach fix, I need to activate it, um, you know, that kind of thing. So it's sort of in, seated in their head beforehand. Teaching emergencies and judgment, uh, risk management. Um, I need to change that. Risk management. Um, what emergency training do you think is most important for a private pilot? Anybody? Unforecast weather. Uh, unforecast weather, flying into IMC, VFR into IMC, yeah. Hmm? Smoke or fire in the cockpit, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, the, the ability to determine what an emergency really is. Learning what an emergency really is. Anybody? Now, I just throw this up here for, uh, mostly for our, um, for you to think about. These are the um, top 10 things that have led to fatal accidents in GA 2001 to 2016. Loss of control in flight, control flight into terrain. Number three, system component failure, power plant. Uh, we'll come back to that. Fuel-related, we have another system component. Unintended flight in IMC, mid-air collisions, low-altitude operations. So loss of control in flight is mostly, um, generally, that's uh, um, if it gets bucketed there, it's because they're maneuvering uh, near the airport or maneuvering. It, a lot of the weather-related, like scud running, stuff like that, get bucketed into those, t those uh, top two. Um, so, uh, <laughs> judgment is the, like of those top two accidents. When you actually look at the accident record and read through the accidents that get categorized that way, those are accidents that happened on the ground between the pilot's ears. Then they made a choice to go fly on that day. Um, not all of them, but a lot of those accidents happen there. And there's not anything 
specific that we're going to teach that's going to, you know, some magic maneuver or skill we're going to teach uh, in the airplane that's going to prevent those. The loss of control in flight is, is a big one, and it's very complicated because there's, that's also where we generally put the stall spin accidents, um, like the base to final stall spin, and that really is about technique. You know, there's a lot we can do as instructors to prevent those accidents, but it's also where we put the, the, um, some of the other more judgment uh, accidents. I put uh, system component failure power plant um, up there is interesting to me because that really is the primary emergency we teach in private pilot training, right? Uh, Off-field landing, is, there's, it's, it's one of the things that's it's listed in the, it's a maneuver you'd perform in the, on the check ride, every check ride almost, probably. Um, and a lot of focus goes into it. Um, I would argue that probably too much focus goes into it, um, especially, um, you know, the, the, well, I don't want to go too far down that road, but I think we, the private pilot curriculum in particular, doesn't focus enough on the other things that kill pilots um, and focuses too much on the power, power plant uh, failure item. Those judgment risk management things, the accidents that happen on the ground between the pilot's ears, are great things to teach in a sim. Um, you can put, you can, um, when I said never create an inescapable situation, the, the escape valve for a, a scenario could be before they get in the, the sim, they say, I would not go flying today. And you said, that is a great answer. You're 100% right. Let's change the weather. Let's go work on something else. Um, like that is, if, to do that well, though, the instructor needs to really sell it. Needs to come in and say, OK, here's the weather in the, in the sim today. We're going to do X and, and start briefing whatever the training event you're going to do. And you're not, you don't want to give them any hint that the weather is a problem. That, the, that this is, and, and try to create the situation where they think, well, I guess it's fine. If you get in there, great. Let's go, let's go see how not fine this really is. Um, and then when you get to the ground brief, I wouldn't do this early on in the training, by the way, right? This is, right, this is before check ride, maybe in the cross country phase. Um, when you get to, when it gets in the airplane and they get in the sim and it's awful, um, and um, that's when you have the briefing and say, you should have seen that weather and said, absolutely not. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you are a flight instructor. I would never go flying in that. Um, and that, that can be a very, very good lesson.